Our next curve is the long run aggregate supply curve. All right, so we know from chapter eight and also our chapter studying GDP that every country has a potential growth rate determined by A, E, L, K. The ideas, ca human capital and physical capital. We built the SOLA model, which lets us understand how economies grow. Remember our catch-up growth and our cutting-edge growth and the steady states and how the U.S. is growing at around 3.2% because of its improvement in ideas. All of these things together give us uh, the potential growth rate of the U.S. economy. The U.S. economy can't quintuple in wealth overnight, right? We can't suddenly make it so everyone has five cars and uh, we all have 15 computers and we're all eating caviar every day and having steak every day at lunch and uh, 46 brand new iPhones. We can't just do that, right? We don't have the technological ability to just suddenly make billions of steaks. We don't have the room to grow the cows. We don't have the ability to give everyone five cars. We don't have the factories to make. What would that be? 400 billion times five. Uh, 400 million times five. A few billion cars. We don't have the technological ability to make all this stuff. So the economy has a growth rate determined by its ideas, capital, and labor. This is the solar growth rate. And we're going to represent that as just a line. We call it the long-run aggregate supply curve. Very simply, it's a straight up and down line. What does it say? The real GDP growth rate, the potential growth in an economy, is some number, say 3.2%. Why is it vertical? Well, remember the y-axis has inflation on it, which means that if inflation is zero, our economy can grow at about 3.2% a year. And if inflation is huge, our economy can grow at about 3.2% a year. This is because the US's ability to produce five cars per person is not limited by the number of dollar bills we print out, but by the number of factories we have and skilled workers we have and ability to make steel and paint and glass. Potential growth is not dependent on the rate of inflation. The potential growth rate is called the solo growth rate from our solo model. And the solo growth rate is the rate of economic growth that would occur with existing factors of production and effective, functional, flexible prices. This is why the long run aggregate supply curve is vertical at the solo growth rate. In the long run, our economy grows based on how much capital and labor and ideas it has, not based on the amount of money that we print in the long run. So we can also put together the aggregate demand and the long run aggregate supply curves. This allows us to see how real shocks, nuclear war, flooding, drought, how real shocks, real changes can affect inflation. Well, the aggregate demand curve, going all the way back here, shows us all combinations of inflation and real growth consistent with the specified rate of spending growth. Important part, inflation and real growth, all the combinations. So we have uh, here an aggregate demand curve showing a 10% spending growth, right? Some combination of the growth rate of M and the growth rate of V is equal to 10%. Maybe it's a 10% growth in the money supply and no change in velocity of money. Our aggregate demand curve shows us every combination of inflation and real growth that could match this. 0% real growth and 10% inflation. 10% real growth, 0% inflation. But in the real world, we can't just say, oh, let's have 10% real growth, right? 
We can't just do that. The real growth rate is determined by the solo growth rates, by capital, and labor, and ideas. The real growth rate is here, about 3%. Well, if the real growth rate, the growth rate of Y, is set at 3%, we have spending growth of 10%, then inflation has to balance the two. The growth rate of M plus the growth oops, the rate of V equals the growth rate of P plus the growth rate of Y. So let's say that the growth rate of M is 10% and the growth rate of V is 0%. This would give us spending growth of 10%. So what are some potential combinations? Well, we said that uh, maybe inflation could be 9% and growth rate could be one, maybe inflation could be 8% and the growth rate could be two. Maybe inflation could be 3% and real output growth rate could be 3%. Ah, so these are all the points on the aggregate demand curve. But in reality, the real growth rate of Y, the real growth rate of the growth rate of real GDP is determined by the solo factors of production. And we said the US economy grows at around 3% a year. So, what do we know? We know that spending growth must be equal to inflation plus the growth rate of real GDP, or 10% equals inflation plus 3%. So the growth rate of P, inflation, must be equal to 7%. It mathematically has to. If spending growth is 10% and real growth is 3%, then inflation will be 7%. Now, there are such things as real shocks, wars, famine, drought. These are things that make the real productiveness of a country lower. Imagine that the United States was bombed, factories blown up, buildings destroyed, farmland ruined. Would we grow 3% that year? Probably not. We would not produce 3% more stuff. We'd probably produce less stuff, right? This is a real shock, a rapid change in economic conditions. In this case, diminishing the productivity of capital and labor. Positive shocks would be something like a new technological idea. After all, an economy grows much quicker when it's invented new ideas, like smartphones. So, a positive shock means that our real growth rate, the growth rate of Y, real GDP growth rate, increases. A positive shock means that our economy is growing at a faster rate. Go back here. If our economy is now growing at 7% and spending growth is 10%, then what's inflation gonna be? It has to be 3% now. So an increase in real growth rate, a positive shock, will result in moving down the aggregate demand curve to a lower level of inflation. What about a negative shock? Famine, war. Well, in that case, our country would be less productive, right? That'll be seen as a leftward shift in the long run aggregate supply point. Our country is destroyed. That would mean long to run lower growth rates. If in this case, our economy is growing at negative 1%, then what does inflation have to be to balance things out? It has to be 11%. Real shocks include weather, oil prices, storms. You can see it very easily in the Indian economy. The Indian economy for a long time has been a highly agricultural economy. 
which means that when agriculture does well, India does well. When agriculture does badly, India does badly. So weather is a real shock of great importance to the Indian economy. If the weather is terrible, crops are terrible, farmers can't buy anything, no one else has anyone to buy their stuff, and so everyone else does terribly. On the left, we have deviation from average rainfall. That is, this is less rain than usual, that's bad. This is more rain than usual, that's good. When there's less rain than usual, agricultural output decreases. When there's more rain than usual, agricultural output, the green line, increases. What does that look like for the rest of the economy? We see over here. When there's less rainfall than usual, average economic growth decreases. Less rainfall than usual, growth rate of real GDP is lower. When there's more rainfall than usual, there's a higher GDP growth rate. Oil is another thing that can cause real shocks. Oil is exceedingly important to a functioning 21st century economy. After all, oil goes into almost everything we buy. It's used to run machines that make things. It's used to run the trucks that move things from place to place. When oil is more expensive, that means it's more expensive to make things. It's more expensive to ship them. That means that with higher oil prices, we're in a real way poorer. We can produce less stuff. So when the oil supply is reduced, things become more expensive and we become less productive. That's why when oil prices are high, the US economy often suffers. You can see this here. Oil prices are often higher during, before, during or before uh, recessions. So perhaps pause and take a look at this sheet. Here's some examples of real shocks. Negative shocks, bad weather, high oil prices, technological slumps, these all make the economy less productive and lower our real GDP growth rate. High taxes are another thing that lowers real GDP growth rate by discouraging people to invent new ideas to grow the economy. Things that improve the economy, good weather, lower oil prices, new technology, not being bombed, right? And lower taxes. Now, of course, there are reasons to have higher tax rates, but one of the advantages to lower tax rates is increased incentive to invent new ideas. As we've said, new ideas increase the solo growth rate. 